As we continue to look at the Bible through the lens of archaeology, we last saw the evidence for Joshua at Mount Ebal and Jericho. So next we'll explore the evidence from the time of the period of the judges with Samson and Samuel to the period of the kings with David and Solomon. Our first stop will be at Beit Shemeth in Israel. The book of Judges records that Samson killed a young lion barehanded. In this video, we will learn about a recent discovery that directly relates to this story in Samson's life. The exciting discovery about the size of a pebble depicts one of Samson's adventures. We can see a very large animal, most probably a lion. But there is a definitely two, uh, a person here reaching out with his end, when he maybe is defending or attacking the large animal. The cone-shaped seal dates back to about 1200 BC, which matches the Bible's time frame for Samson's life. It illustrates a scene from the book of Judges where Samson is on the way to meet his fiance in Timnah, about four miles away from the dig site. Suddenly a young lion came roaring toward him. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him in power so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as he might have torn a young goat. Now I'm not saying that Samson is, uh, is depicted here, but the, definitely the myth or the legend is depicted here, so it's in the right place, the right scene, in the right time. This place is also of great archaeological interest for other reasons. It's where the Bible says the Philistines returned the captured Ark of the Covenant. So they put it on a cart with two cows pulling it, and the Ark went to the way to, on the way to Beth Shemesh. Tel Aviv University archaeologist Dr. Svi Letterman and Professor Shlomo Budimovitz have led the excavations here each summer for more than 20 years. A British group first excavated the site in 1911 against the backdrop of the growing popularity of Darwin's theory of evolution. They knew about the Philistines from the Bible, but they wanted to expose the realistic background of the Philistines to, to bring the biblical stories alive. And people inhabited the area continuously for more than a thousand years until the Assyrian king Sennacherib destroyed it in 701 BC. Today, modern Bet Shemesh is across the highway. Next summer, archaeologists hope to uncover more of a palace from an earlier era they think may have belonged to a mysterious female who ruled the Canaanites from Bet Shemesh. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Bet Shemesh, Israel. It is believed that Samson lived until around 1079 B.C. Now we will go back to the area around Nablus, Samaria. Until 1903 AD, the exact location of Israel's ancient capital named Shiloh had been uncertain and many debated its existence. Different ancient historians contradicted each other about the location of Shiloh, so scholars who actually believed in a place called Shiloh were unsure where it may be located until 1903. It was Professor Hirschman Tiersch who by accident discovered the ruins of Shiloh. The site is located east of Nablus beside the traditional site for the tomb of Joseph and near Jacob's well. Shiloh was where the people of Israel set up the tabernacle after entering into the land. Hannah prayed outside of that tabernacle for a son, and God answered her prayer with a son she called Samuel. Shiloh was where Samuel grew up with Eli and where he first heard the voice of God. Also, this would have been the site where Eli fell and died after hearing of the ark being taken by the Philistines. Shiloh is so well confirmed that it is now a major tourist attraction and archaeological park that attests to the biblical record. In this video, we will learn more about the discovery of Shiloh and how you can visit there today.
first of all, we already know that ancient Shiloh is a very important site for the history of the Jewish nation and also for the history of the world. And it's before the government, and we're very happy that the government decided that they're going to work with us and they're going to develop the site. The first thing that we're going to do is archaeology dig. We're going to expose the whole city, and we're going to build a very big visitor center uh, for the thousands of people who are going to come and visit the site. We're very proud of the Israel government who made this very important decision. For those who aren't familiar, what is uh, Tel Shiloh? Okay, ancient Shiloh, Shiloh was our first capital, the place of the tabernacle, the place where all the tribes got their land. This is where uh, Tu Be'ab, the Jewish love holiday, started. This is where Hannah prayed for her son, for Samuel. This was our first capital before Jerusalem. Shiloh is um, north from Jerusalem and east from Tel Aviv. It's about 20 minute drive from Jerusalem, 30 minute drive from Tel Aviv. And it's in the center of Israel where all the Bible stories happened. What's happened in the past year is we've built a, a new uh, visitor center, which is almost complete. Pesach is supposed to open. They've got a, a movie that will be shown with uh, on, the, on the windows there, which are transparent and opaque. The movie will be shown, and as you hear the story, as you see the story, the movies become clear, and you see the place where the things actually happen. You see the Mishkan, you see the people and the places at the same time. Modern technology, multimedia, presenting a very, very ancient story. It tells us how you uh, hope to connect people to the to the region, to the area through the story. And the story is one of the most famous stories in the Tech, the story of Hannah coming to Shiloh and praying for children. That's the reason thousands and thousands of people come to Shiloh. But now you'll actually be able to see the story, not in a movie somewhere else, but actually on the site where it actually happened. And people there see it and they're able to connect to, to Hannah herself. While many years uh, people used to promote uh, or, or, or connect people to Judea and Samaria by saying it's so close to the sea, uh, tactically speaking, we're talking here about, we see it also on your shirt, the land of biblical heroes. That, that, that connects people nowadays, right? Okay, the truth is in Binyamin is where most of the Tanakh actually takes place. Most of the stories are written are in the stories of Betel and Shiloh. And the reactions? The reactions of people to be actually being in the, in the site and, and actually feeling where, there, where things happened is always amazing. Jews, Christians, they all come. Here we see an aerial photo of Shiloh and you can see the outline where the tabernacle stood. And this is where Samuel grew up. Samuel was called a prophet of God while living with Eli in Shiloh in 1143 BC. It is believed that Samuel lived until around 1010 BC. Next we will look at a site located at the Valley of Allah in Israel. In 1 Samuel we read that David killed Goliath the Philistine in the Valley of Allah, so there should be signs of the Israelites in that area. This video will review some of the finds regarding David from outside the city of Jerusalem. Here in Jerusalem, his name is everywhere. David is the most famous king in Israel's history, but some say he wasn't the great ruler described in the Bible. One Israeli archaeologist said that David and Solomon did not rule over a big territory. It was a small chiefdom, very poor. This is a great chief. If you want to call King David chief or King Solomon a chief, this is a great chief and this is a huge tribe. <laughs> Others say he never existed at all. Even a professor of biblical studies who insisted, I am not the only scholar who suspects that the figure of King David is about as historical as King Arthur. These guys said, well, they didn't have any historical memories, so David and Solomon are pure mythological figures. One by one, those archeological memories are being uncovered and all over Israel, excavators are confirming the biblical story of Israel's greatest king. The 
The Bible records David's story in great detail. From his days as a shepherd boy to his death in the royal palace of Jerusalem. Today, you can walk in the same places where David walked, and they still have the same names as they did 3,000 years ago. There's Bethlehem, the place where he was born, and where he was anointed the king of Israel at just 15 years old. This is En Gedi, the desert oasis where David hid from King Saul in caves like this one and Hebron, where he spent seven years as the king of Judah. For centuries, the Bible was the only written evidence that King David ever existed. There was no archeological record of his reign until about 150 years ago. In 1868, a stone tablet was discovered in Jordan. It was written by a Moabite king named Mesha, an enemy of Israel. The stone dates to around 840 BC, less than 200 years after David, and it contains the first known reference to the House of David outside the Bible. In House of David, it's mean Dynasty of David. So we know that there was a guy called David and he created a dynasty. Okay, so this is now absolutely clear that David is not a mythological figure. The same phrase, House of David, turned up on another stone more than 100 years later, this time in northern Israel. It was written about 200 years after David's rule, again by one of Israel's enemies, Hazael, the king of Damascus. He said, I killed 70 kings. I killed, I killed a king from Israel and a king from the house of David. One of David's greatest victories took place here, in the Valley of Allah. This is where the young shepherd boy killed the giant Goliath And it's one of the few places where you can still catch a glimpse of the Israel that David knew. Nearby are the ruins of the Philistine city of Gath, the hometown of Goliath, and the remains of the brook where David found the stone that killed him. High above the valley is a fortress that's thousands of years old. To the local Bedouin, this place is still known as Kirbet Daoud, or David's ruin. It's the only Iron Age city in Israel that's perfectly preserved and almost frozen in time. For us as archaeologists, this is one of the richest sites in Israel. This is like a biblical Pompeii. The Hebrew name is Kirbet Kaiafa, or Fortress of Elah. Archaeologist Yosef Garfinkel first uncovered the city in 2007. He recovered some burnt olive pits from the site and sent them to Oxford University for carbon dating. The results surprised even Garfinkel himself. Turned out that the dating of all these beautiful cities and all the find is from about uh, 1020 to about 980 BC. And this is exactly the time of King David. In David's day, the Valley of Allah served as a neutral zone between the Israelites and the Philistines. In Kaiafa, which was right on the front lines, excavators discovered a large cache of weapons. We are sharing some light on the story of David and Goliath. That we are in the same location in the same time, and uh, the city is heavily fortified, we have all these weapons. So it's telling you that this was indeed a, an area of conflicts between two political units. In the Bible, this fortress is mentioned with a different name, Shah Arayim, the city of two gates. In 1 Samuel 17, Shah Arayim is the place where the Philistines fled after David killed Goliath. Sharaim means in Hebrew two gates. In Hebrew Kayafa we have two gates. So if you take the biblical tradition, the location, the chronology, the meaning of the name, all these three aspects, you have fits Kayafa perfectly. Just 10 days after Kayafa was discovered, critics argued that it was a Philistine city, not a Jewish one. So Garfinkel went to work proving them wrong. What is the ethnic component of the city? I think that the city is Judean based on four arguments. His first argument is the city's design. We have a casemet city wall and houses abutting the casemet city wall. This is now from four other sites. So now we have five sites. 
All these five cities are in Judah. None of them is in Philistia. So this is really typical Judean urban planning. His second argument is the animal bones found in the city. All of them strictly kosher. We have sheep, goat, cattle, but we have no pigs and no dogs. And in Philistine sites, they consume pigs and also dogs. Up to 20% of the animal bones in Philistine sites are uh, pigs, but here nothing. Point three, this pottery shard, also known as an ostracon. It's the earliest example of Hebrew writing ever unearthed. On it are written commandments to worship the Lord and to help widows, orphans, and slaves. It started with the word al taas, which means don't do. And taas, uh, to do, is only in Hebrew. It's not Canaanite and not Phoenician. The absence of idols also points to a Jewish city. If you go to Canaanite temples of the late bronze, you will find in them a lot of uh, human and animal uh, figures, but not in Chibet uh, Kayafa. So the people here really obeyed the biblical taboo on graven image. There were no idols, but there were religious shrines. These models predate Solomon's temple by about 40 years, and yet they match the Bible's description of the temple, down to the triple frame doors. They're the first physical evidence of Jewish worship in the time of King David. It was not my mission to come here and to prove the uh, historical uh, authenticity of the biblical tradition. When I came here, I have no idea. And these are the results. These are the animal bones. This is the radiocarbon dating. This is the inscription. These are the fortifications. And then you have the biblical tradition. And what to do, they just happen to fit nicely to each other. David killed Goliath in the Valley of Allah in 1025 BC. Next, we will move to Old Jerusalem, known as the City of David, because it is recorded that he conquered this area and made this city their capital and the geographic center of the life of Israel. In 2 Samuel and 1 Kings, we read that David captures the stronghold of Zion, we know as the city of David, and he is later buried there. Excavations of an ancient city bordering on the Kidron Valley have been excavated under four different groups, Ottoman, British, Jordanian, and Israeli. David's astounding city, ancient Jerusalem, has been strongly confirmed by archaeology. In this segment, we will see evidence for David from inside the ancient city of Jerusalem. I'm standing with Daron Spielman, who's the senior director of the City of David. City of David is directly to the south of the old city of Jerusalem. It's an archaeological wonderland where the Jewish roots of the presence of the Jewish people in the land of Israel is being uncovered all the time. Daron, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Where are we right now? We're in a restricted zone. We went over some funny rocks over here. Where are we? What are we doing here? Yishai, there is the center of the world. And within the center of the world, there's Jerusalem. You are very close to the founding of actual Jerusalem. We are standing on stones with walls around us on bedrock, which used to be underneath my office. Meaning this, five years ago, I worked about 25 feet over our heads in a little wooden office. This was solid ground. Until one day, about five years ago, Dr. Elat Mazar, who works with the Israel Antiquities Authority, she came into my office and she said, Daron, I wanna show you a picture. She took out a picture and laid it on my table. It was this picture of this pillar head. She said, Daron, do you know what this is? I said, Elat, everyone in Israel knows what this is. It's on the five shekel coin. I brought a five shekel to show you. See? One to one, baby, one to one. All right, five shekel coin, I see that, okay. So what is it, a five shekel coin? Why, why did this make the five shekel coin? Everywhere in Israel you go, where there's a palace from one of our kings, David, Solomon, and afterwards, we have found these pillar heads, meaning these adorned the top of beautiful pillars. She lays this picture on my desk and she says, Daron, in the Jordanian phase, when the Jordanians occupied Jerusalem, this was found in the city of David. I said, a lot of everybody knows this. What's the story? She said, listen, I drew a line from where this was found, showing how it must have rolled down the hill, and the place it originated from 
is underneath your office. Now, Yishai, when she said that to me, I was 25 feet over our heads, and I remember tapping the floor with my foot, saying, there's no way King David's Palace is beneath my feet. She said that King David's Palace was here, and that launched an excavation which uncovered perhaps the most important archaeology ever connecting our people to Israel. King David's Palace, those are big words. Those are three big words, and, and when you say King David's Palace and the fact that you're finding it here, that... That just says the Jewish history is real, that it happened here, and that there was such a person, there is such a hero, there's such a leader, and that's something that we're going to explore today. You're going to show us around a little bit about the city of David, you're going to show us the beauties of this site, and you're going to also show us how this has become such a mainstream concept uh, in the story of modern day Israel. Well, I'll tell you, when a lot came here and we dug down, she found all around me these walls, massive dress stones which were cut with tools. Underneath these stone walls, she pulls out pieces of pottery, which date to the Jebusites. And if you look at who King David captures Jerusalem from, he captures it from the Jebusites. Three thousand years ago, the entire city of Jerusalem fit on this 12-acre hill. Here you can see part of the wall rebuilt by Nehemiah, the water tunnel dug by King Hezekiah, and the Pool of Siloam, where Jesus healed a blind man. This is the city of David. Welcome to the city of David. Good morning, my name is Miriam. Today, it's one of Jerusalem's top tourist sites with close to half a million visitors every year. This is one of the most exciting places on earth. People from all over the world come to this place and for the first time understand that what they're reading in the text matches the archeology span in the ground. The city of David is more than just a tourist attraction. It's also a live archeological dig. The Bible says this is where King David built his palace and one archeologist says she's found it. For Alat Mazar, digging is a family affair. In 1948, her grandfather, Benjamin Mazar, was the first archaeologist to get a digging permit in the new state of Israel. And when the Israelis recaptured Jerusalem in 1967, he started excavating the area around the Temple Mount. His granddaughter, Elat, was working by his side when she was just 11 years old. What I've learned from him, the major thing is that the Bible is part of our historical sources to be used and re-studied and re-examined again and again. It doesn't object in any way to our scientific, archaeological capability of using the best methods for excavations. It goes side by side and it fits beautifully, and it should. Like her grandfather, Mazar is uncovering the Jerusalem of the Bible, layer by layer. In 2005, she started digging in the city of David with one goal in mind. King David's palace. <laughs> well, I had my assumptions based on the evidence at that time. And then when I started the excavations, um, it was, of course, an open question. It wasn't long before she found what she was looking for. We saw the large walls of some structure, but they were so large that I said, wow, okay, forget about King David's palace. We're talking about a fortress here. We realized that this structure, as monumental and impressive as it is, is the first structure ever built in that spot. So the question, who built this structure and what was this structure uh, built for? Mazar soon found her answer. We've got a marvelous, marvelous historical source, which called the Bible. The core of historical events surely are there. Second Samuel 5.11 says the Phoenician king Hiram sent messengers to David and cedar trees and carpenters and masons, and they built David a house. So it's a palace fortress, well built for good reasons. This is most probably the palace that King Hiram built for, for King David. We know its date, which is around 1000, which is the time of King David. The Phoenician style of construction is quite emphasized. The Phoenicians 
our great builders as we learn from our excavations in Phoenician sites. Inside, the team found more evidence of royalty, from ancient seals used by court officials to a variety of carved ivory utensils, too expensive for a regular home, but perfect for a palace. The major part of this structure is still hidden, needs to be excavated. What we have in hand is less than a quarter, I would say really much less. We will now see a virtual reconstruction of ancient Jerusalem from the pre-temple period. David took Jerusalem in 1003 BC. And David lived until around 970 BC. The Bible records that Solomon built the first temple and increased the walls of Jerusalem, among other things. He also used an exceedingly large amount of copper or bronze, as some Bibles translate it. In this segment, we will see the evidence that's been found confirming King Solomon. We will see the wall that he built and part of the area where Solomon had the copper mined. Across the street from the city of David, Mazar is directing another dig as well. Just outside the Temple Mount, she found more royal ruins, this time from David's son, Solomon. In 2010, excavators revealed a giant wall more than 220 feet long and almost 20 feet high. Mazar says this is the city wall described in 1 Kings 3, which says that Solomon built the wall all around Jerusalem. It connected David's old city with Solomon's new temple. We can really say that the biblical description of King Solomon Building the wall of Jerusalem around suits so well what we see. This is the only place that a fortification line is needed. It's surrounding that area. It connects to the Temple Mount. It's everything that fits the biblical story. Critics were quick to dispute Mazar's conclusion, but she had carbon dating on her side. Pottery shards found at the ground floor dated to the 10th century BC when Solomon was king. Sometime in the late 10th century, early 9th century, the king of Jerusalem built a most highly skilled fortification that indicated it's a strong regime, centralized with great abilities. But then we have this biblical story that tells about King Solomon doing the same thing. So he did, and then like 50 years later, some other king did the same thing. So I think we can drop all these, you know, fighting against the Bible. The reality was that the sophisticated fortification was built by King Solomon. And this is only part of it. And it's very impressive. Inside the wall were more clues pointing to King Solomon. First Kings 4-7 says that he had 12 governors who provided food for the king and his household. And inside the gate, Mazar's team found evidence of their work, jar handles with seals inscribed to the king. 
and large clay jars for storing grain. Mazar believes they came from the royal bakery. On one of the vessels, there is an inscription, um, incision in ancient Hebrew, saying that lesar ha'o, meaning to the minister that was in charge of the ofim in Hebrew, which bakery. Biblical skeptics suffered a devastating blow this Monday, October 27, 2008, when the prestigious Academy of Sciences reported that an international team of archaeologists has uncovered the copper mines owned and operated by the biblical King Solomon in the ancient mining and metallurgy district in southern Jordan. The study, supported by grants from the National Science Foundation and the National Geographic Society, is led by Thomas Levy from the University of California at San Diego and Mohammed Najjar of Jordan's Friendships of Archaeology. The researchers reported in their current issue of the Journal of Proceedings from the National Academy of Sciences. Now, according to the Bible, God chose King Solomon to build Jerusalem's first temple. Hundreds of tons of copper were given to the project, as well as smaller amounts of gold and silver. The temple I am going to build will be great, because our God is greater than all other gods. But who is able to build a temple for him, since the heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain him? He made a bronze altar twenty cubits long, twenty cubits wide, and ten cubits high. He made the sea of cast metal, circular in shape, measuring ten cubits from rim to rim, and five cubits high. It took a line of 30 cubits to measure around it. Some English versions of the Old Testament use the word bronze instead of copper as a result of a immense translation, the archaeologist Levy said. King Solomon and his father, King David, would have had to have ruled Israel during the 10th century BC, scholars all agree. Now, industrial-scale metal production was occurring at the site in Jordan in 10th century B.C., according to the study's carbon dating of ancient industrial mining debris and analysis of the settlement's layout. We have conclusively shown that Iron Age chronology of this region has to be pushed back another 300 years, said lead author Thomas Levy, an anthropologist at the University of California, San Diego. The shift in estimated Iron Age dates means that the Jordan copper mine would have had to been in operation during the reigns of Kings David and Solomon. If he built the temple during the 10th century BC, according to the Bible, he had to bring a lot of copper to Jerusalem, and the copper had to come from somewhere, said Amahe Mazar, an archaeologist at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, who was not involved in the study. It is reasonable to figure the copper came from the closest known source, the contemporaneous site excavated in the area the Bible calls Edom. Now we have to address many of the questions about the relationship between the Bible text about this region and those centuries and the archaeological record, Levy said. Levy said in a university statement, this research represents a confluence between the archaeological and scientific data and the Bible. Once again, the Bible is supported by the evidence. Solomon lived until 931 BC.